good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. We're going to go ahead and get started with our session. Today, I'll be talking about how to read food labels. And uh, my name is Samantha Shabur. I'm a registered dietitian in the UHN Cardiac Rehab Program. I'm based out of the Toronto Western Hospital site. I also will be um, carrying out these nutrition sessions with my colleagues Fatim and Veronica. They're going to be on the line to answer any of the questions that you may have near the end of today's session um, and they will be holding hosting the other sessions on uh, the nutrition topics as well. So thank you so much for joining. Before we jump into the session just to set some ground rules these are uh, just education sessions. Um, if you have any specific questions that are personal or individual, we do recommend that you connect with your healthcare provider to get specific advice. Um, any of the questions that you post will just be answered generally. There won't be any specific individual recommendations. Um, and if we don't get to your question today, we will do our best best to answer them as soon as possible and all of the questions will be posted online. This webinar will also be recorded so that you can always come back to it uh, in a, at a later day if you want to brush up on the food label rating we go over. Our goals for today's session are to help you identify the different parts of a food label and we'll be talking about the ingredients list, serving size and percent daily value um, specifically. And We'll go into a good amount of detail about what is a low or high percent daily value. You may want to grab a packaged food item that you already have in your house and just use that food label and follow along with us as we do this session. This might help you come up with any questions that you may have. Um, and once again, just ask them in the Q&A section there at the bottom. So why is this information important uh, for you? Um, our research shows that most people find reading food labels difficult, but attending label reading sessions such as this one can lead to more confidence in reading food labels and then can potentially make you help make healthier food choices. On packaged foods, you can find nutrition information in three different places. Uh, all packaged foods will have a nutrition facts table and an ingredients list. Nutrition or health claims are optional, so you won't always see them on a package. So we're gonna start with how to read an ingredients list. And you'll find the ingredients list on the back or side of a package. It lists all of the ingredients used to make the food. It's important to know that the ingredients are listed in order from most to least based on their weight. So that means that the first ingredient on the list is found in the highest amount, and the last ingredient on the list is found in the smallest amount. When you read an ingredients list, look where sugar, salt, or oils are listed. Um, these are things that a heart healthy diet may want to limit. So things like sugar, salt, and oils. Try to find foods that have these ingredients at the end of the ingredients list. If you're buying a grain product like breads or cereals, try to choose foods that have the words whole grain as the first ingredient on the list. In Canada, there are some new food labels that will be coming into place and they should all be in place by 2021. You may start to see new, uh, some packages have some of the new labels. Uh, we'll go over some of the changes that are being made so that you can be prepared and know how to read them. One of the biggest changes to the new labels is how ingredients will be listed. On the left side of the slide, you'll see the original ingredients list. So this is what you'll find on most packaged foods currently. Um, and in red boxes, you can see different names for sugar, such as fancy molasses or brown sugar. The new labels will make it easier to identify sources of sugar because all of the sugars will be grouped together. So you can see here on the new labels, we have sugars and then in brackets, all of the sources of sugar that are found in this product. Next up, we have the nutrition facts table and the nutrition facts table tells us about the nutrients that are in a food. It must include a serving size, calories and a percent daily value. And we'll go into some of these in more detail soon. 
It also must give information about 13 key nutrients. So you'll see that those 13 key nutrients are listed here. And these are just a snapshot of some nutrients that are found in the food. Um, there are others that are found in the food, but they don't need to be listed on the food label. If you do see other nutrients that are listed, those are optional and they're up to the manufacturer of the food product to actually put them uh, on the nutrition facts table. The nutrition facts table will always look the same from one product to another, and that should make it easier to find the information you're looking for. Um, and on this slide, we'll just go through some of the key nutrients that are important for many cardiac patients. So of course, the most important thing we always start with is the serving size, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But we would like to look at things like total fat, saturated fat, sodium, fiber, and sugar to help us choose a product. So when you're reading a food label, it's important to start with the serving size first. This is because all of the information listed on the nutrition facts table is based on the serving size amount. And the serving size will be given in measures First, that you are probably quite familiar with, so common household measures. Here you'll see it says one cup. And then in brackets, you'll see the, um, the metric units. So that would be the weight or the volume, so grams or milliliters, which can make comparing different products easier. It's important to look at serving sizes when you're comparing products because they may vary between different brands. And on this example, you'll see that the serving size is for one cup of cereal, and this one cup of cereal weighs 55 grams. Right now, different brands may have different serving sizes. Um, so the new food labels will try to make these more standardized, and that will help uh, make it easier to compare similar foods. These serving sizes will also be similar to the amount you'd likely eat in one sitting. So the example we have on this slide here is uh, showing a small 473 milliliter carton of milk. And the original food labels, so the original on the left-hand side in blue, would allow a serving size to be one cup, which is only half a carton of milk. But since most people that buy a small carton of milk would probably drink the entire carton, the new food labels, so the one in green on the right-hand side, would change the serving size to be for one whole carton of milk, as this is the amount you would likely drink in one sitting. The next part of the food label you'd want to consider is the percent daily value. And the percent daily value is generally found on the right side of the nutrition facts table and is given for most nutrients. So here we have it uh, in this green box. So you'll see it says percent daily value here, and it'll just be found right on this section here. And the percent daily value tells you if there is a little or a lot of a nutrient. So a percent daily value of 5% or less is considered low, whereas the percent daily value of 15% or more is considered high. So for example, in one cup of this cereal, there is six grams of fiber. So we can see here, um, so in one cup of cereal, there is six grams of fiber. So unless we know how much fiber we need for the day, it might be hard to know if there is a little or a lot of fiber in this product. But if we look at the percent daily value, we can see that it is 24%. This means that there is 24% of a whole daily recommended fiber in one cup of this cereal. And since this number is higher than 15%, this would mean there's a lot of fiber in the cereal. It's important to remember that everyone is different and that the daily values are set for the general population and are based on a 2000 calorie per day diet. So your needs might be a little different than uh, what is listed on the percent daily value for some of these nutrients. So some nutrients that we'd wanna see a percent daily value of 15% or higher would be fiber, vitamins, and minerals like calcium or iron. These are nutrients that we want to try to get more of in our diet. And for nutrients that we want to limit, such as saturated fat and sodium, 
we'd want to choose products that have 5% or less of the daily value for these nutrients. If you look at this label here, you'll see that there's currently no percent daily value for sugar on the older labels, but new labels will eventually include one. Uh, for now, be aware that sugar is something we wanna try and limit in our diet. And we'll come back uh, to this in a little bit to help you figure out how to interpret the grams of sugar on a label. So we have a little bit of a learning activity and so I just want you to take a look at this nutrition facts table and take a look specifically at the calcium and the iron. Using that 5 and 15 percent uh, rule that we just talked about, does this food have a low or high percent daily value of calcium? And does it have a low or high percent daily value of iron? So I'll give you a moment to take a look at this and come up with your answers. So because the calcium in this product is 2%, which is less than 5% of the daily value, this would be considered a low calcium food choice. And because the percent daily value of iron is 50%, this is a high iron food choice. But you may have noticed that this product is a cereal and you see that there is a second column and this column shows the nutrition information if you added a half a cup of skim milk. So since skim milk is a high calcium food, the percent daily value for calcium goes up from 2% to 15%. So now this would be considered a high calcium food choice. So as I mentioned, you'll see that there's no percent daily value listed for the sugar, um, but new labels will, will include this. And so for now, we can uh, just keep in mind that the recommended amount of added sugar for women is less than six teaspoons or 24 grams of sugar per day. And for men, it's less than nine teaspoons of sugar or about 36 grams per day. And this is referring to added sugar only. And so that would include things like brown sugar, honey, molasses, jams, and fruit juices. However, some foods like yogurt have naturally occurring sugar in them. And this would not be included in the daily limit of six to nine teaspoons per day of added sugar. Unfortunately, in Canada, most food labels don't distinguish between naturally occurring sugar, such as lactose, which is found in yogurt, um, and added sugars. So to help you determine if a food has a little or a lot of sugar, you want to do some math. It might be helpful to grab a calculator or maybe your phone as well as a pen and paper if that would help you. Um, so four grams of sugar is equal to one teaspoon of sugar. So if you take the grams of sugar that's listed on the nutrition facts table and divide that by four, you'll get the number of teaspoons of sugar per serving. So we can actually take a look at this in practice. So we see here in three quarters of a cup of yogurt, we have six grams of sugar. And if we divide that by four, we'll get 1.5 or one and a half teaspoons of sugar. So you can see at the top, this yogurt is unsweetened. So all the sugar is likely naturally occurring sugar coming from lactose. On the right hand side, we have a sweetened yogurt, which contains 19 grams of sugar for three quarter cup serving. So if we divide that by four, we get 4.75 teaspoons of added sugar. And most of the sugar is likely added sugar. Um, if we compare to the unsweetened yogurt, we can see there's a big difference there. From these two choices, the unsweetened yogurt would be a more nutritious, low sugar choice. So next up, we have some information around nutrition claims. And nutrition claims, there's a wide variety that you might see on products, but once again, they are optional. Um, so some claims you might see are a very high source of fiber, high in protein, fat-free, low fat, light, no added sugar, unsweetened, cholesterol-free. Um, 
these claims must meet specific guidelines that are set out by Health Canada to be added on a food label. Um, and they can be helpful in choosing a product, but it's always important to look at the ingredients list and nutrition facts table rather than relying on nutrition claims alone. So for example here, we have uh, an olive oil and you can see that it says it's an extra light tasting olive oil. So in this case, light or extra light can refer to the color or the flavor um, and it can have multiple meanings. Um, so in this case, it's not referring to the fat content of this oil, it's referring to the flavor or the taste of it. This claim on this can of soup states that it has 25% less salt. Um, and so that can be a little bit misleading as well, because when we look at the nutrition facts table, we can see that it actually contains more than 15% of the daily value for sodium, which is another word for salt, and that would make it a high sodium food choice. So it's always important to read the nutrition facts table to find the actual amount of sodium in each serving um, or other nutrients in each serving. A helpful claim though is the no salt added uh, or low sodium nutrition claim. And those can be found on canned legumes, tomatoes, and certain sauces or broths. This means there was no salt or very little salt used in making the product. And this can be helpful when you're looking for low sodium foods. Another helpful claim is the high fiber claim, and this can be used if a product has at least five grams of fiber or more per serving. So if we look at this cereal, we see there's six grams of fiber, which is 24% of our daily recommended fiber, and this could carry the hot, very high source of fiber claim. Looking at nutrition claims can be very helpful to help you make a quick choice in the grocery store, especially right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, you may wanna minimize how much time you're spending in grocery stores. So looking for these claims can be helpful to cut down the amount of time you're spending in the store. You may also wanna check out food labels online. A lot of grocery stores or products, you can actually view the information on various products, the nutrition information online. So that can also be a great way to save time in the grocery stores. In terms of more resources to help you read food labels, we have many resources on the Cardiac College website. We have an entire Eat Healthy booklet. And if you check out page 59, there's gonna be some information around food label reading. We also have other nutrition related videos on food labels, reading food labels and nutrition health claims that you can check out. And we also have an entire video and tip card series on the Cardiac College website. So helped uh, in choosing a healthy soup or what to look for when you're choosing a healthy bread. And there's various information around the nutrition facts table, what you would wanna look at on the nutrition facts table, um, as well as the ingredients list and some other helpful tips. So once again, that's just available on the Cardiac College website. Okay, so that was a great uh, overview of label reading uh, by Samantha. And Veronica and I are here now uh, to answer any questions. So if you do have a question, uh, please feel free to type it into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer them. Okay, so I see there's a question here about lactose and why lactose wouldn't count. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, I think the question is referring to added sugar uh, that Samantha mentioned. Um, and so when we think of uh, the, the sugar in milk, the lactose, that's part of the natural sugar. Um, and then when we think of the, the sugar that you find in things like fruits and vegetables, that's natural sugar. Uh, those natural sugars are not included in our uh, goals or our, our, our limits for added sugar and added sugar would be um, the sugar that's maybe added to the yogurt like a sweetener um, or honey um, or it could be you know sugar that you're adding to the food before you consume it um, and I think that's why lactose wasn't included um, and in terms of the added sugars uh, we do have limits and we're generally recommending that women stick to six or less teaspoons of added sugar per day 
and for men, uh, nine teaspoons or less added per day. So I hope that's answered the question. If not, um, maybe you can just uh, re or clarify uh, the question a little more. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks Fatim. And there's another question here about sodium. The question says, is sodium and sodium chloride the same thing? Now most table salts are made from sodium chloride. So that's salt and um, you know, we always suggest reducing our salt and it's because of the sodium that's found in the sodium chloride. So the sodium uh, mineral is the one that's actually affecting our, our blood pressure. So um, we do use sodium and salt interchangeably, but it's actually the sodium mineral that um, we do want to reduce and um, therefore we want to reduce our salts because salt is sodium chloride. So I hope that makes sense. Great. Um, so another question about salt. Uh, are there different types of salt which are better for the body than sodium chloride? Um, so absolutely, there are many types of, of salts. Um, when we look at table salt or sea salt or kosher salt or Himalayan salt, uh, those are mostly sodium chloride. Um, and you know, a, a teaspoon of any of those salts would be about 2,300 milligrams of sodium. Um, when we look at other salts, um, you can get other mineral salts, for example, potassium chloride, um, and that might be found in some of your salt substitutes, like no salt or half salt. Um, and I think overall, just as you have to be careful with the sodium chloride, uh, in many cases, you also have to be careful with other types of salt. Um, so that's a very brief answer. Uh, we did cover a lot of this information uh, in a previous webinar about sodium and blood pressure. Um, so if you have a chance, maybe you can look at that webinar to answer your questions. Um, there's also a great sodium section on our website. Awesome, thanks Fatim. There's also another question about sodium here. Uh, the question reads, any estimate of how much sodium is washed away when you rinse canned legumes? Um, i.e. you buy or have normal salted cans. So the estimate that I've read most recently ranges, but obviously depends on um, how well you rinse, I guess, the, the canned beans, but it could range from 10 to 20% reduction of sodium when you wash those canned legumes. Uh, when you do uh, purchase canned legumes in the grocery store, there's two options usually. One is uh, the normal, canned legumes and the other one is no salt added. So that's one of those nutrition claims that Sam mentioned. And that one would have very, very low amount of sodium in it. Um, so that would probably be the best choice to choose a low sodium option. Okay, Great. thanks Veronica. Um, so a question about almonds. Are almonds good for you? I think they have a bit of saturated fat when you look at the nutrition information. Um, and that's very true. So um, all nuts, whether it's almonds or walnuts, peanuts, pistachios, cashews, whatever you like, um, they are uh, recommended as part of a heart healthy diet. Uh, we know the Mediterranean diet uh, promotes the use of nuts on most days of the week. Um, and they do contain quite a bit of fat. But if you compare the amount of healthy unsaturated fats, uh, to the amount of saturated fat, you'll notice that the saturated fat is very small. Um, so the benefits far outweigh um, that little bit of saturated fat that you find in them. Um, nuts are also a great source of protein and fiber. So um, I think that you know if you have a handful of almonds every day, um, that's a heart healthy food to include. Great, there's another question about sodium, uh, it reads, why do you, or sorry, why do low fat or light foods seem to contain a lot of sodium? So that's an excellent observation. A lot of the time when you do see light or low fat on the front of a food label, if you flip to that nutrition facts panel, you'll actually see that, yes, it will be low in fat, but it would be higher in sodium and also sometimes higher in sugar. 
And that's like the, the case is because when you're removing fat, you remove a lot of the flavor. So they have to replace the flavor with something. And uh, an inexpensive, easy way to do that is with sodium and sugar. So uh, that is usually what happens. And um, again, great observation there. So when you do see low fat or light foods may not be the healthiest option out there. Uh, you know, make sure you're flipping to that nutrition facts panel and checking what type of fat is actually in that product. Is it unsaturated fat or saturated fat? Unsaturated fat is the healthier type of fat and it's actually okay to eat that type of fat. Whereas the saturated fat is the one that we wanna limit. We don't wanna avoid it, but we don't wanna have too much of it. So see how much is in that product. Uh, does it fit into your eating pattern? And perhaps that may be a better product than the, the light or low fat product that is actually higher in sodium and sugar. Okay, another question here. Is um, whole wheat bread as good as any other whole grain bread? And are all whole grain breads uh, equally healthy? So a Great question. So I think a lot of us uh, have bread um, almost on a daily basis. I think the key when you're looking at the label on a package of bread is to look for something that's labeled 100% whole grain. And that is a regulated term. Um, and what that means is that the entire grain is used in the, the processing of or making of that bread. So you get the outer layer or the bran uh, where you get most of the fiber. Um, you get the, the endosperm or the starchy part, but you also get the germ where you find a lot of the vitamins and antioxidants. So if it's labeled 100% whole grain, uh, it can be whole grain whole wheat or whole grain rye uh, or whole grain multigrain. Those would all be great choices. Um, the key is that 100% whole grain so you know you're getting uh, the most nutrients as well as the most fiber. Another question that came in asks, what are some of the tricks that manufacturers may use on their label to make things appear healthier? And I guess when I read that question, the one thing that comes to mind that they, they sometimes use is those nutrition claims. When you think about what Samantha was talking about, she talked about three things, nutrition claims, nutrition facts panel, and the ingredient list. The nutrition facts panel and the ingredient list, you can't really um, manipulate. It has to be, you know, the ingredients have to be in the product and then the nutrition facts panel, it has to read how many nutrients are in it. Whereas that nutrition claim, those, as Samantha mentioned, they have associated definitions to each of the claims. And sometimes manufacturers will use those claims to their benefit. So for an example, um, a common one that I see is when they use um, low, that this product is low in cholesterol or no cholesterol. And a lot of the time I actually see that claim on plant foods. So things like maybe licorice or candy and it will say cholesterol free on the, the front of the package. And um, you know, when I read that, of course, that looks like it's going to be or appear healthier than it is. But in fact, when I, I think about cholesterol, we know that cholesterol is only found in animal foods. Uh, it's never found in plant foods. So when I think to the product itself, if it, if it is candy or licorice, it, it's coming from a plant. So it never had cholesterol in it to begin with. So the manufacturers aren't removing cholesterol for our benefit to make it healthier. It's just that they're using it more as an advertisement uh, because they know that those words people are looking for to, to choose their, their product. So I would say, if anything, they're using those nutrition claims to their benefit uh, to make items appear healthier than they may be. So you can still use those nutrition claims, but I would always flip to that nutrition facts panel in the ingredient list just to confirm that uh, that, that product is, is actually healthy or what you are looking for as a consumer. Okay, great. Um, so another question coming back to the breads. Um, I've noticed that all bread seems to have a lot of salt. And that's very true. That's a great observation. 
So if we look at most breads in our grocery store, uh, you might notice that a serving might have anywhere from 150 to 200 milligrams of sodium. Um, and that does add up, especially if you're having bread at more than one meal in the day. Um, so uh, in terms of looking for lower sodium breads, you wanna keep in mind um, that 5% or less goal for sodium. Um, and if you look at different manufacturers, um, they have very various different types of whole grain breads, but sometimes the sodium can vary quite a bit uh, from variety to variety. So for example, um, some of the big brands like Dempster's or Country Harvest or Dimple of Meyer, um, they all have different breads and they do vary in their sodium content. Um, so it's just going into the grocery store and, and just comparing the different varieties and trying to find one that's lower in sodium. Now, if that's challenging, um, maybe just think about balancing off the higher sodium bread with other lower sodium choices. So for example, if you're putting a spread on that bread, maybe you're looking at a natural peanut butter that doesn't have any added salt or um, another type of nut butter, or maybe you're gonna use some avocado or olive oil, things that are naturally lower in sodium to sort of balance out that higher sodium bread. But it is a challenge, I agree, to find out a low sodium bread. Great. Another question came in. It says, I have tried to find a low sodium cottage cheese and it's very hard to find. Any that you know to suggest? And unfortunately, I haven't come across any low sodium cottage cheeses. Just the way that cottage cheese is made is that it is higher in sodium. So um, not to my knowledge that there is a low sodium cottage cheese out there. What I would recommend is, you know, you could, instead of using cottage cheese, you could use other soft cheeses like uh, mozzarella or ricotta may be nice um, as an example. Or you could include the cottage cheese, even though it may have sodium in it. And then, you know, pay attention to the rest of your day and trying to make sure that you are eating lower sodium choices uh, throughout the rest of the day, which would, you know, include whole foods, fruits, vegetables, um, and just being more careful with the other food choices. Great. So a few more questions coming back to the bread. So is a whole wheat loaf the same as whole grain? And there's another question, is 100% whole wheat the same as whole grain? Um, and then it is quite confusing, but unfortunately in Canada, those are two different uh, claims. The hundred, as I mentioned, the 100% whole grain claim means that none of the grain has been removed. So you get the maximum benefit from the nutrients and the fiber. Uh, when it just says, uh, whole wheat or 100% whole wheat, they're still allowed to remove a little bit of the grain. So it's not the same as 100% whole grain. So if you're in the grocery store, uh, what you do want to look for again is that 100% whole grain, whole wheat on your package. And most, most labels will, will show that right on the front. Um, I also forgot to mention that uh, on the Cardiac College website under choosing healthy foods, we have a, a video all about how to choose a healthy bread and it goes over some of these points. So it's a nice summary and you can download a tip card as well that shows you exactly what to look for on a, a bread label to make sure you're getting the healthiest product. Great. A uh, question here, which is the better choice, butter or margarine? Now, when I think about this question, we have to think, you know, when we're talking about the difference between butter and margarine, it's, it's the fat different, the fat, the fat content's different, and it's the type of fat. So, you know, butter is hard at room temperature, which means that it's mainly a saturated fat. And we know that too much saturated fat can actually increase our LDL or our lousy cholesterol levels. So we don't want too much of that in a day. When we think about margarine, margarine is spreadable, uh, so it has less saturated fat at room temperature, and it has more unsaturated fat at room temperature. Um, when we think about unsaturated fat, 
we do want to include unsaturated fat at every meal because that has actually shown to reduce our LDL or our lousy cholesterol levels. So when we think about that, margarine would be the better choice. If you, but then it, I guess it also depends on how much saturated fat you're consuming for the rest of your day. So say that you're, you're practice mainly a vegetarian eating pattern, you're not going to be consuming a lot of saturated fat throughout the day. So butter could fit into your eating pattern on a daily basis. Perhaps you like to use butter when you're cooking your mushrooms uh, because of the, the flavor that it comes out. Of course, something like that could be incorporated into your eating pattern, even if you do eat other saturated fats like animal meats. So it it's not an easy answer uh, or straightforward answer. I guess it always depends. But if you think back to um, the difference between butter and margarine and, and how that can fit into your eating pattern. The other thing I just want to mention about margarines is that in the past, all margarines had something called trans fat in them. And trans fat is something, uh, you know, I guess it's a man made type of fat that when we consume it, it can actually increase our lousy cholesterol or LDL cholesterol, and it can reduce our healthy cholesterol. So we don't want any trans fat. So all margarines, when they came onto the market, they had trans fat. Now, a lot of them have taken out the trans fat. So, you know, the, the big name margarines have like a basil, you know, blue menu, they do not have trans fats. So they're okay to consume. But if you are consuming margarine, you just want to check to make sure that um, there is no trans fat in your margarine, if, if that's the one that you choose. So I hope that's not too confusing of, uh, of an answer for you. But again, just think back, how much are you eating of it? Um, if it's every day, maybe margarine. If it's a, once in a while, maybe it's butter. Okay, question here. Is the source of the product important for nutrition? So for example, fish or lettuce um, that's from Canada or Ontario versus imported? And that's a great question. Um, so there are certain products you'll notice in the grocery store that don't have a nutrition facts uh, table or an ingredient list. And those include things like fish, um, unprocessed meats, your fruits and vegetables. Um, and they're not required to have a label because it's only just one ingredient, just that product. Um, in terms of the, the nutrients, um, you know, it, they can vary depending on the variety. So more in terms of the, the, the type of fish, uh, whether it's cold water or warm water fish, um, the type of lettuce, whether, you know, it's a, an iceberg lettuce versus a, a darker green lettuce. I think that would uh, af affect the nutrient composition a lot more than where it's coming from. Um, so you know, in terms of fish, uh, the, the ones that come from colder waters tend to have more omega-3s. And in terms of your leafy greens, the darker green ones tend to have uh, more of the antioxidants and vitamins. But that's a very general rule. Um, I think uh, overall, it's, it's all about variety. Um, and if you can buy local, I, I think especially uh, in Toronto in the summertime, um, if you do get local produce, um, it's traveled uh, a lot less and it hasn't been sitting around. So it hasn't lost some of the nutrients um, as it's being transported on the truck or just sitting in the grocery store shelf. So uh, in that way, uh, local produce is a, a better choice. Um, and you're also supporting local farmers, which I think is a great thing. Great, these are great questions. Thank you so much for submitting them. Another question reads, which foods reduce triglycerides? So actually nutrition and diet play a big role in reducing our triglyceride levels. So if that's high, there's, there's hope to change, um, to help reduce that through food. One of the big things you could do is make sure that you're not eating a lot of those added sugars uh, or refined processed carbohydrates. So you wanna make sure that you're choosing those whole grain breads that Fatim's talking about. Uh, you know, make sure you're choosing things like brown rice over white rice and then reducing and not having too much of those 
added sugars and um, and sweets, candies, desserts. Uh, also, you need to think about how much alcohol you're having that has an impact of our triglyceride levels. And especially if that alcohol is mixed with things like juice or pop, because we know that too much sugar can increase our triglycerides. So juice and pop do have those added sugars in them. So thinking about that in your food intake. Um, another thing that you could look at to reduce your triglycerides is if you're eating enough of those omega-3 fatty acids. So those are things like those cold water fish, salmon, mackerel, trout, sardines. Those are very rich in omega-3s and, and we want to be eating those two to three times a week. So are you eating that? And uh, if not, maybe you could increase them. Other forms of these omega-3 fatty acids can be found in plants and they're usually, you know, I guess some of the common foods are things like flax seed, uh, chia seed, and hemp hearts. Those are big ones. Walnuts also have some omega-3s in it. So are you consuming enough of these omega-3s? And, and if you're not, then maybe that's something you wanna try to include. Uh, those plant sources that I mentioned, you want to be including those every day. And then uh, lastly, it would be thinking about the fats that you're eating. So how much fat are you having? How much saturated fat are you having? Are you having too much? Maybe that's increasing your triglyceride levels. Remember those saturated fats are the ones found in, in animal meats, animal products like the butter that I mentioned earlier. Or are you eating those trans fats? Uh, so trans fats are usually found in things like uh, vegetable shortenings, uh, like I said, some margarines as well. Um, there is, a, you know, in Canada, coming this year, I think in September of this year, they are going to ban trans fat from being purchased from our grocery store. So it will be much easier for us to to help manage that and not eat too much of these trans fats. So so come September, there's uh, there's hope that um, it'll be easier. So I hope that helps just to summarize for triglycerides. We wanna make sure we're not adding too much sugar. We're watching how much alcohol, we're eating enough omega-3 fatty acids, and we're not having too much saturated or trans fats. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so there's a question here. Is plant-based vega protein and greens, which contains 80% vitamin K, good to have? And the second part is, is that too much vitamin K uh, to have for diabetes and a TAVI procedure? So um, the first part of the question, um, so a lot of these um, protein or vegetable powders uh, do have a lot of powdered greens, and that's probably your best source of vitamin K. So when we think of our dark green leafy vegetables, they are high in vitamin K. Um, and we recommend you try to get uh, most of your nutrients from your foods rather than these supplements. Um, so for example, you know, having a salad or having some vegetables every day is going to give you uh, a lot more uh, fiber and antioxidants that you would get in these powdered supplements. So I always try to think of how can I get my nutrients from my, my food. Foods, um, getting in all those different types of fruits and vegetables. Um, and also remember, you can never replicate um, all the benefits of eating whole foods in a, in a pill or a powder. Um, in terms of the amount of vitamin K you need, um, that can vary. Uh, we do know that vitamin K can interact with certain blood thinning medications. So for example, if you're on warfarin, you might have been told to watch your vitamin K intake. And that's probably where you would consult with your doctor or a dietitian uh, to work out um, how much vitamin K is right for your particular circumstance. Um, but for overall health, like all vitamins, vitamin K is an important part of your heart health. Uh, we know it helps in terms of memory and brain health, um, a lot of enzyme functions, uh, blood clotting. So it is an important vitamin to get. Um, but just consult with your healthcare provider about the amount that's right for you. Great, thanks, Fatim. 
so we are over time. So there are two or three more questions here that we'll make sure that we provide an answer, a written answer, and we'll uh, post it on the website, um, hopefully by tomorrow or the next day. Uh, so feel free to uh, link back to, to view your answers. Great, so tomorrow's session is uh, another walk and talk with Rob. So we encourage you to attend that. Um, remember that is yeah, an exercise session as well as uh, some conversation with Rob. That would be great. And then next Tuesday, there is um, a great presentation about, uh, well, it's titled Quit Playing Games With My Heart, Sex Differences and Cardiovascular Disease. So we encourage you to, to tune into um, to this session. It's with uh, one of our doctors that was um, with us at Toronto Rehab, Cardiac Rehab Locator the Toronto Rehab location last year. So uh, I'm sure it will be a fantastic presentation. So feel free to tune in and, and we will be back next Wednesday to talk more about nutrition and heart healthy eating. So thanks for attending today and thank you for all your awesome questions. Thanks everyone, this was great.